underneath. You know, it's always been said that they can hear a bull under two feet of snow at 100 yards, which is phenomenal. And it's because of those big facial discs. Brook trout, a beautiful fish, right? One of my favorite. Um, they are the native trout of this region, so. I used to admire the colors, especially later in the fall when the birds were more mature and just say to myself, wouldn't it be beautiful if we could preserve some of these? Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. And by Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in western Minnesota. And by Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. Located deep within the vast tracts of tamarack and spruce trees in northeastern Minnesota, lies a landscape with a storied history. An area once deserted by mankind, now filled with wildlife perfectly suited for what remains in the region. In the early 1900s, the bogs around the small towns of Sachs and Zim were drained in an effort to increase agricultural production in the area. When those efforts failed, the towns dried up. Various conservation groups, land management agencies, private landowners, and visitors to the area worked hard to protect the habitat that remains. The sachs zim bog area may not have been a success for farmers, but what it left behind has become a haven for birds and those that love to watch them. The Saxon Bog is about 300 square miles, roughly, of, you know, it's not just all bog, though. It's a mix. It's kind of the magic mix, we call it. There's lowland tamarack and spruce. There's, uh, there's upland aspen. There's areas of maple. There's meadows. There's old farms, towns, rivers, lakes. But it's really that, that the big, extensive tamarack and black spruce bogs that give it its name. Wildlife watchers and photographers from all over the world come to the bog to view the various birds and animals that spend time there, specifically during Minnesota's colder months when the main attraction can often be seen hunting from a branch near one of the many roads that intersect the bog. So we have nine species of owls that people can see here, which is probably more than any place else on the continent. The star of the show, for sure, is the great gray owl. They are year-round residents here. They nest in these bogs. They're easiest to see in the winter. And then second would probably be the hawk owls. They um, sometimes nest in the bog. We have a good sharp-tailed grouse population. And uh, this morning it was fun because we got to see them popping out of the snow drifts. Uh, they will burrow into the snow on cold nights. And then in the morning they'll just kind of pop out and uh, go about their business. And then we saw them fly out onto the lek, and the lek is the dancing ground. And they were, you know, even though it's January, they were amped up and chasing each other and displaying. And so the testosterone is already flowing here in, in mid-January. While the Saxim bog might still be new to some Minnesotans, the area has gained fame across the world. Well, interestingly enough, uh, a friend of ours in New Hampshire has a Zaxim bumper sticker on his uh, birding vehicle. We started talking to him about it a couple years ago and told us what a great place it, place it was and we just started doing our research and we heard you guys had a, a lot of owls here this year and decided to do the trip. We've seen four or five great grays. Yeah. Uh, two northern hawk owls, two. which was a lifer for me. Yeah. 
Uh, they both put on great shows. We watched them hunting, and uh, uh, that was just a lot of fun. We've seen both the Great Grey and the Northern Hawk Owl oh, yeah. watch them hunt. That was fun. Yeah, absolutely worth it. Great place. So here at the Saxon Bog, you got some snowshoe trails. You got to have a special hat if you're going to go snowshoeing. Here we go. Great Greys are hunting, you know, completely by hearing. They are looking down in the snow and they're not really looking with their eyes, they're looking with their ears. And, you know, their big facial discs are, I mean, exactly, we've all heard it, like little satellite dishes. And they are just kind of moving the satellite dish, trying to tune in the signal. And uh, they can hear that bowl rustling underneath. You know, it's always been said that they can hear a bull under two feet of snow at 100 yards, which is phenomenal. And it's because of those big facial discs and then their ears, their ear holes are in the front of their skull. One's a little different place, a little different size and shape. And so once they hear something underneath the bull screen under the snow, they can launch off that perch and kind of float out over the spot. And they're looking down the whole time and they're triangulating. And then once they lock on, they're just poof, they just plummet straight down, face first. At the last second, they might throw their feet up in front and they can reach down 18, 22 inches under the snow, pluck a vole out. And sometimes you'll see them go down and they'll come in looking down. They're not looking, they're still listening. And they're, they're kind of taking their feet and going like that because they might've missed it. And they're trying to catch it. And then once they catch it, they'll transfer it to their beak and then they'll look around because they're kind of, they don't want anything else to take it from them. And then they'll fly, you know, either swallow it on the ground whole, or they'll fly up to a perch and, and eat it whole. 97% of their diet is voles. Redback voles, meadow voles. Occasionally they'll take uh, shrews. They are big birds with little beak, little talons. Uh, their whole life is built around voles. Owls may be the main attraction, but other birds are popular with visitors to the bog. My entire life I've uh, been an animal caretaker and I've fed the birds, I've, I've fed the wildlife. and I grew up on a farm and I guess I started doing that when I was a little farm girl. Mary Lou has set up a bird sanctuary on her property in the bog. It's my uh, pleasure my joy, my hobby. In the winter time, I go through 200 pounds of bird feed a week. It, uh, it relieves a lot of stress. It just puts life and fun in my life. The bog is an important bird area designated by BirdLife International in Audubon, but that carries no protection at all. In 2011, I got together with some friends and said, you know, Saxon Bog needs a voice. People were coming up here from all over the country and it was just a bunch of dirt roads and people would say, oh, you know, is this it? You know, and we felt, you know, we gotta, we gotta build a welcome center and we gotta start buying up land because the rate of black spruce logging was increasing. Uh, we're not anti-black spruce logging, but black spruce is kind of the critical habitat for these birds that people wanna see. And it takes 80 to 120 years um, rotation, logging rotation for black spruce. A lot of people are owl crazy and uh, you know, they hear about the owls here and they, everybody is telling us, I wish I could go. And we tell them, hop on a plane. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great place. The Saxim Bog is an expansive rural area about an hour's drive from Duluth, an area worth visiting to spend hours watching its residents and learn a little bit about our past here in Minnesota.
beaver spawning. Uh, it can't be real silty, as you imagine, like is in a beaver pond and stuff. So I'm trying to measure that as well. And these include the, a lot of the sportsmen's favorites, you know, the redhead and the canvasback, and the, these big white back ducks. Beavers and brook trout both live in the pristine streams of northeast Minnesota. But can they coexist, or could beaver dams threaten the cool water habitat that trout need to survive? Bemidji State University biology professor Andy Hapes and graduate student Katie Rennick have embarked on a two-year study to answer that question. Beaver are a keystone species that have huge impacts on the environment. Uh, that they live in. Lots of other organisms rely on these beaver dams or are affected by the beaver dams. Growing up as a kid, I trout fish like crazy. You know, the first time I can remember going fishing was my dad, he put waders on me and I still had my shoes inside of those. And as I went through school, I learned a lot about water quality and how the animal populations within the, those water bodies uh, are better if the water quality is better. The most important thing about this study is determining the effect of beaver on brook trout, specifically in this region, um, northeast Minnesota along the North Shore, to be able to help management agencies decide whether they should be removing beaver dams or keeping them to help co-manage for both beaver and brook trout. Northeast Minnesota has more than 1,500 miles of designated trout streams. The cool temperatures are ideal for native brook trout that cannot tolerate temperatures warmer than 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Brook trout, a beautiful fish, right? One of my favorite. Um, they are the native trout of this region. So brown trout, rainbows, things like that were definitely stocked in this area. And that's one of the reasons that this project is focused in on that. Beaver dams can potentially impact trout streams by warming water temps, altering water's flow and depth, and increasing sediment and erosion. But the dams also create critical habitat for waterfowl, moose, frogs, and other wetland wildlife. To help the DNR manage the streams to best suit brook trout and beavers, Katie and student Kylie St. Peter have sampled 31 streams and 10 beaver ponds and will do the same next summer. I'm studying brook trout habitat, so those variables include temperature, um, depth, uh, velocity, and substrate, which is important for spawning habitat. So at each point along the stream, I'll be collecting those variables, and it goes into my GPS, and then later I transfer it onto the computer, and each one of those points gives me an overall score from zero to one. Zero is bad habitat, one is good habitat and then I can map the entire stream so I can see where exactly is good habitat and where is not very good habitat. Temperature is very limiting for brook trout. They like the cooler water temperatures. So that's what we're looking for out here. Um, we're looking for the deeper pools and more of the riffle areas for them as well. And we're also looking at substrate um, and they need good flow. Um, substrate is very important as well for spawning uh, it can't be real silty, as you imagine, like is in a beaver pond and stuff. So I'm trying to measure that as well. All my data is going directly in to this. And then with this here, this is my YSI that I've got tucked in, and that's gonna be collecting um, things such as uh, temperature. So I've got that and it's hooked onto my foot here. The great thing about this GPS as well is I can put it on my computer right away and I can map it out and I can see, oh, that stream had great habitat. So it's interesting to see as I go too, um, which ones are good and which ones aren't. Each stream I'm doing 200 meters. Um, it's either upstream or downstream. And I'm also collecting invert, invertebrate through our drift samples. Um, I'm getting about 200 samples, 200 points along each stream. Up here along the North Shore, some of these streams are really, really rocky. So balancing ourselves and making sure our equipment doesn't get in there is really hard. Some days that 200 meters seems like a really long ways up there. I am sampling beaver ponds as well. I have this little float tube that I go out on this paddle and I'm collecting um, temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, depth, and substrate in those as well. So I float around in a beaver pond all day collecting those measurements, kind of the same as the stream. I'd say I'm very, surprised by the beaver ponds. Um, they either have good habitat in them or they have absolutely no habitat in them. So I'm really, really excited to analyze some of my data and see what's driving those factors. 
Besides sampling temperature and other stream conditions, the researchers are trapping bugs like mayflies and caddisflies to see how plentiful the supply of trout food is. Katie will be collecting data for one more summer to analyze how much beaver dams are impacting trout streams using an HIS score ranging from 0 to 1, which is the optimum habitat. So far, the best has a 0.36 and is 100% suitable. But she's finding that dams in wide areas of the stream that aren't well shaded can increase temperatures and degrade trout habitat. Final results will be available in 2019. I grew up on a trout farm in um, western Nebraska, so I've been around fish my whole life, and I'm just very passionate about fish. I love being out here, and I love, I mean, it's beautiful out here, the serenity of it, and to be able to collect data and provide a helpful tool for agencies, I think is very important, and it's just very nice to be out here. It's beautiful. Watch out for the aqua invaders. These innocent looking plants and fish might be handsome and flashy, but they're choking habitats in the land of sky blue waters. Whether we invited them here or they hitchhiked in, we're out to identify these aquatic invasive species and stop their spread. This segment was brought to you by the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Forces of Candio High, Big Stone, and Yellow Medicine Counties. Charles Hansen may be the best known taxidermist in Western Minnesota. His extensive collection includes every North American waterfall species and rare wildlife from around the world. And it's all on permanent display at the Big Stone County Historical Society Museum in Ortonville, Minnesota. Charles' interest in taxidermy started as a young boy growing up on his family farm on Artichoke Lake. Artichoke Lake was basically a swamp when I first could remember it. A lot of bulrushes out there and um, just a waterfall haven, especially diving ducks. In the fall, canvasbacks and bluebills and redheads were so common on the lake. Now you can go through a whole fall and not hardly see a duck on the whole lake. But back then there were thousands of ducks. Well, my uncles were hunters and they came in from Artichoke Lake with an assortment of different uh, waterfowl. I used to admire the colors, especially later in the fall when the birds were more mature, and just say to myself, wouldn't it be beautiful if we could preserve some of these? Taxidermy is the art of removing a bird or mammal's skin, preserving it, and mounting it on a pre-made form. When Charles started learning the craft in the 1950s, he made his own forms and mounted up to 50 species a year from a workbench in his basement. He did this over the winter as he also farmed 500 acres of grain until retiring 20 years ago. Three of Charles' uncles owned the Artichoke Lake Trading Post, opened in 1927. When the country store closed in the 1970s, he decided to convert it to a museum to house his mounts in climate control display cases. I spent many months just laying out the design of the different cubicles, you know, for what I thought would be appropriate for, for each section of, of bird. Charles acquired his 500 bird collection from hunting around artichoke and in Arkansas, California, and Alaska. Many were taken by Eskimo hunters. Families of waterfowl are displayed together. Besides 12 subspecies of Canada geese, Charles' collection includes a blue-winged goose from Ethiopia, Siberian red-breasted geese, and the emperor, 
arguably the world's most beautiful goose. His duck display includes dozens of surface feeders that range from the familiar green-headed mallard to the European Baikal teal. And there are gadwalls, widgeons, and elegant pintails. Some of the most targeted in Minnesota are the diving ducks. And these include the, a lot of the sportsmen's favorites, you know, the redhead and the canvasback. And the, these big white back ducks with the red and sloped black bill are the canvasback. And if you were to take a survey amongst uh, waterfall people, I think they would all say that's probably their, close to their favorite duck. They're such an elegant duck. That there's basically only three colors, but just the way they're designed and the way they fly and the history of, the, of that bird is just one of my all-time favorites. In the sea duck collection, there are eiders from Hudson Bay and ducks from Australia, South America, and Africa, including the beautiful African pygmy goose. Finally, we see a vast assortment of North American birds, like kingfishers, a sharp-shinned hawk, trumpeter swan, and great gray owls. In 2005, there was an influx of great gray owls from Canada, and they were short on food. You know, their favorite food was the red-backed bull, and when they did not have enough of those for enough to sustain them, they came down by the thousands in, into Minnesota, and these were hit by vehicles. So there's three of them here, three of those from around 2005. I think there were probably around 1,500 of them that were killed by vehicles. Charles Upland game birds range from prairie chickens and many species of grouse to the ptarmigan, and the capercaillie, the world's largest grouse found across Eurasia. While there are many spectacular birds, Charles says the most difficult to mount are the tiniest. If you can mount songbirds, you can mount most anything because they're so fragile and so, so delicate. I think the smallest one I've ever worked on there would be a red-breasted nuthatch. But even the bigger ones are not, not exactly easy to work on. Most of his non-game birds were hit by cars, but one of Charles' road kills didn't make the collection. About a three pound fish came out of the air and hit the windshield of my car and disintegrated. And then I looked up and here was the big eagle cir circling up above me. He had dropped that fish at just the right moment to come into my windshield when I was going 60 miles an hour. Think of the odds of that happening. Besides birds and some small animals like an Arctic fox and bobcats, Charles' display includes thousands of Plains Indian tools, hammerheads, axe heads, skinning blades and scrapers that he picked up around Artichoke Lake and the Missouri River. All this time spent outdoors, collecting and farming, has kept Charles connected to the natural world. I've seen a lot of changes in the num numbers and kinds of wildlife that we see. Back when I was a kid, we had no coyotes, no otters, few, few and far between beavers, no wild turkeys, no eagles, almost never a Canada goose that was except very high, either going south in the fall or north in the spring. But we have a lot of restoration of wetlands that have proven not, not to be suitable for farming that have been re reclaimed and gone into, back into conservation as waterfall production areas, and I think that's great. What Charles Hansen has preserved for all who love the outdoors will live on long after he is gone. Our job? is to protect this diverse array of waterfowl and upland game birds in their natural habitats.
Have a question for Prairie Sportsman? Contact us at prairiesportsman at pioneer.org or hashtag AskPS on Facebook and Twitter. For more on Prairie Sportsman and to view episodes online, go to prairiesportsman.org. Thanks for tuning in and be sure to get outdoors this week. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. And by Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in Western Minnesota. And by Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected.